This episode of Verbal Tap brought to you by NogiBJJGear.com. Use the promotional code of VerbalTap15 to get 15% off of your order. Do it! I'm home for Thanksgiving. I'm about to get fat with some turkey, maybe work some leg locks, which means it's time for verbal tap, which you know it is because the crowd in the background you hear is our guest at a fucking bar and grill while we're podcasting. Uh, I am your host, Kevin. With me, of course, Rafa Sparza and someone named Flo, who's a local waitress and here to ask, did you want that iced tea with less ice, more ice? Raph, how are you doing? I'm great, but you know what I've learned this week, Kev? Hmm. If you don't like America, move to Puerto Rico. Their politics are much better. Yeah, I was was a little surprised to see Gordon uh, jump and chip. It sounds like our guest is ready, like chomping at the bit to chime in. Uh, He is. You you have no idea how many fucking phone calls and text messages I got about a very dumb meme I made. Uh oh. Well, I didn't know that you had made a meme about it, but maybe we should get to that. Um, Tony Burchak, welcome back to the show. What meme did you make about him? So, uh, my my number one, the guy the guy that will be my first black belt, Willie Autofree, uh, current brown belt, Ten Planet. He um he's a Puerto Rican, right? And he's got still family in Puerto Rico. His family has come here from Puerto Rico. He posted in a uh, in our comp group. The, the quote of Gordon Ryan saying, you know, we're, we're doing an affiliation. It's going to be huge. I can't wait to share with everybody. So I, uh, I photoshopped the 10th planet logo on that Homer Simpson meme where he's walking back into the bushes and it comes out with another one. So he had the 10th planet shirt on him as he walked back into the bush. And as he came out, he had DDS on him. like 12 people fucking message him was like, bro, you left 10th planet. No way. What happened between you and Tony? <laughs> What's going on? Did you guys have another fight? What's going on? So, it was fucking entertaining to say the least. Uh, you know, dude. Well, what's going on? Did you guys have another fight, or is everything? Okay? <laughs> no, not at all. He no, just no. he was so excited about Gordon. He was so excited about Gordon moving to Puerto Rico and opening an affiliation that I absolutely just go, yeah, this cocksucker is a dick rider. He's gonna jump ship. Hey, let me tell you something. As somebody who has made many a memes, and even though we usually have a pretty good sense of humor of not going over the line, there always tends to be somebody who gets unnaturally butthurt about something to the point where we go, huh? And Incredibly. The best response, and I'm sure this is different because it seems like there's some sort of split that happens during the affiliation but if i could speak to those people who might have been affected by that meme just logically figure out if the statement you're going to make is going to come in the form of homer simpson that you guys have split just logic maybe put that behind i'm just saying everybody goes i know if willie got kicked out of 10th planet they would have to kill him and drag him out because (laughs) if they didn't the building would get fucking burnt down first that's how i know you didn't leave Well, the one thing I'm looking, the one thing I'm very much looking forward to seeing, though, is maybe in about three months' time, Gordon putting up a post about how Puerto Rico has lost its way. It's not the same Puerto Rico he moved to three months ago. So, anyway, that's just what we're starting off with. Tony, did you get to see the fights last night, man? I did a bunch. The only fight I didn't get to see is the Arian Lipsky fight because I had to go drop my son off with his baby with my baby mom. Totally understandable. The layers uh, of the Tony Burchek are starting to fall right into place. I, I told you, bro. And, I'm ethnic. Are I'm, you? I'm ethnic. I got child support and other issues that, that you guys can't deal with. <laughs> are you at Applebee's right now? What is the name of this establishment? It's called Illegal Pete. Mm, the Mexican food. It is Mexican food. Yeah, you basic bitch. Just out there in chain <laughs> restaurant. Bill. I am. It's like it's like a bar. It's like a Chipotle. I know a what bar. illegal pizza is. Shut up. <laughs> I've obviously eaten there. I like their quesadillas. It's fucking so rad. I know. They got good beer. They got good beer. They started so, apparently. They started in like Denver and then like went to Tucson, then Tempe, 
Oregon and like California. Yeah, Raph, did you mm. know I lived in Denver? That's the originator mm. of illegal Pete's. We were the people when they were just legal Pete's. We supported them. <laughs> really? Well, no, I don't know. <laughs> they when they were did... legal Peters. We were like that name sucks. They're like we can fix it. Legal Peters. <laughs> so Jesus. let's maybe try to get a little bit of sense of what's going on here because again, we have had guests in the past appear at different places. You obviously Listen, are at a restaurant guys, right okay. now. Look at this is what happened. All right. I had some shit going on earlier in the day, training wise, and then I caught a private and then I immediately had to go to a podcast, which lasted way fucking longer than I thought was gonna last. I thought this was gonna be like an hour and a half podcast started at five. I didn't get there till five thirty because they were getting beer. So then like five thirty and then nine PM here, something like that. We just talked for fucking ever. So that's why when I messaged you, I go, holy shit, we're coming up on Pacific time, and I'm supposed to be talking to these guys at mountain time. I got to fucking go. So the, the, I, I abruptly ended their podcast, and then I realized I had 2% on my phone, and I'm like, well, if I go home, my phone's out of commission. I'm not talking to these guys. I don't have my iPhone charger in my car because I left it at my gym. What do I need to do? Bingo. Go to Willie's Bar. Get his phone charger, sit at the bar while fucking while I just lay here, blast in the background, and I hear Willie screaming at customers across the bar. That's the best fucking idea. BT Dubs, the same Willie that allegedly was no longer with Ted Planet. So oh, yeah, no, this all checks allegedly out. Allegedly, the same Willie that is no longer with Ted Planet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot right, to this Willie. episode. Brought to you by Raph. I'd like to interrupt you. Brought to you Please by do. Manscaped. Mm -hmm. All we know about what we do is that it's important to look your absolute best. Not your second best, not your third best. You want to look your first best. You want that ball polish look. You want that, did I go through a car wash and just let my testicles do the washing? That's the look you want for it. That's what you get at manscaped.com. You know what I'm talking about. Go get Manscaped. Raph, Use the promotional code Verbal artist. Tap, Kev. Drop in the fucking Verbal Tap. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, use that. Verbal Tap. Do that, Thank too. Thank you. All right. Let's start right you know, at the top You know what they now. say. If you nip the sack, send it back. And then, ladies, <laughs> if you're hurting the curtain, then get the Lawnmower 3.0. That's what I got to say. Yeah. Well, pay that, man. They pay should be sponsoring way. him. I don't know why we're curtain. taking the money here. Free the bush, you know? Just give it a little uh, modeling. So, Tony, let me go ahead and start getting this back on track. I want to ask, what was your initial reaction to Davison Figueroa hitting that guillotine on Alex Perez yesterday, sir? <clears throat> Literally, that, that fucking fight was lost in inches. If, if Perez would have just cut his nose to the left into Figueroa's back, he avoids that guillotine. If he kick one more time on the calf. He avoids that scissor sweep, which he avoided anyway. But the fact that, I mean, as soon as I saw Figueroa throw the scissor sweep on, like the, whatever, the Connie Basami, um, and press stop it, I go, yeah. So every 10th planet leg locker has jumped that on him, <laughs> and he stopped it. This is a, a well-versed guy who understands the leg navigation, Immediately started throwing punches at Figueroa. Say, Figueroa showed his back. Perez took it. Didn't cut his nose to the left into Figueroa's back. Gets caught in the guillotine. Starts panicking and backing out, standing up. Has no other option but to tap. And it looked as if there was a second where Perez could have navigated the grip exchange a little bit better to get his head out of the fucking guillotine. And it was, it was just on too tight, man. So I was talking about this to people today, and I was like, dude, he was just a half second behind on so much of that guillotine, but, like, he was close. You could see the crown of his head start popping up just a little bit, and I was like, dude, that time that he wasn't doing a two-on-one -on, on the grip, and then that time that he wasn't trying to, like, push that arm down a little bit with the force of gravity. Vastly different, so correct? Close. Vastly different. It was so close, man, and, like, him... It, it's always it's always 
easier for us to say what was going on, you know, but fuck, dude, I feel like if he got that much of the back of his head out of that guillotine, he was one or two maneuvers away from getting out. And here's kind of my interpretation. The reason why it was so epic is we all were rooting for Alex. Like, Alex is good people. And I think just seeing him get that close was kind of heartbreaking in the sense of, like, dude, we could see it for you, and we were pulling for you to just get that head out. The only thing that I think did really, really help matters for Davison is when he made the adjustment of making Alex carry his weight with that grip on the guillotine and I said damn dude how could you not be impressed with what that meant right there yeah what, what's crazy is when you look at like it, it's easy to get a guillotine like let's say I'm in full guard right and I go for like a hip bump sweep to the, to the right my right and I and he drives into me and I drive back to my left and captures neck that's easy that's fine we're talking about technique but after I gave up my back, you're taking my back, and I hip escape out and capture your net, and then continue to solidify the choke. It was masterful, man. I mean, it shows why that kid is the fucking flyweight champ of the world. So what did you think that moments after that fight, when they announced that Brandon Moreno was going to get the ticket, and that it's going to happen in 21 days? Wait, what? Yeah, I didn't know that yeah. part. No one told me that yeah, shit. Sorry, I didn't day see it. I was driving from 21 Denver day to turnaround, Kansas. dude. 21 day turnaround. Fucking nuts, right? That's not many days. Yeah, no, no. they're fresh. Let them go. Let's do that. That's what we're here for. It's 21 day turnaround. I'm trying to make money. He's trying to make money. I'm trying to be the world champ. Let's fucking roll. So, but Moreno let's give you a little bit of like prelims final card. <laughs> and figure arrows just like fuck it. I did watch I did watch the ESPN preview show for this. The mm-hmm. But but Figueroa's listen, the flyweight division that, the flyweight ahead. has been, has been like this. When when um when Chris Carriasso, uh at the time who was my coach got the title fight, it was because uh it was because Demetrius Johnson had cleared out one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven and mm-hmm. Chris was ranked number eight. So when you look at Moreno being on the main card of the or, or the, the main event of the prelim card, it, it, that's that's the division. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care how it shakes out or where he's at. That's that's how that fight's got to go. He's got to go right now. And the fact that they offered Cody Garbrandt the title fight was super disrespectful. Yeah. yeah. Kev, just to give you a little bit of uh, background on uh, Moreno's fight. Moreno was fighting Brendan Royval. Now, that fight was weird. You may notice that it ended in the first round at 459. Was it bananas? There's a reason for that. B-A-N-A-N-A-S? It actually was quite bananas, and here's why. Moreno and Royval were just exchanging and throwing caution to the wind. It was very exciting, very compelling. There was a little bit of a back take situation. Royval looked like he was in trouble. Looked like Royval had a moment, though, where in transition, he kind of fell to the ground and Moreno looked up, saw the clock and said, let me continue down with some hammer fists. It didn't look like it could have been stopped. It looked like Royval could have toughed it out. But we later learned that Royval had a shoulder injury. And yes, they did pop it back into place shortly thereafter. Tony, did you pick up on any of that? Because to me, I was but like, dude, that, I think he might survive this no, round. No, so we were confused. It, when, when we saw the wrist, it looked as if Moreno had a Kimura grip, right? And it looked mm-hmm. like, we were like, wait, wait, wait. There's, there's so much arm spaghetti going right, right now. What the fuck is, whose hand is that? And then we go, oh, fucking shit. He's pulling his own arm down. He's trying to get his shit back in the, in the joint. And... I mean, Brandon did his job, right? He 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 yeah. mopped up and was like, "This is my opportunity to win. I don't give a fuck how this turns out. He's not moving. I'm gonna hammer fist the fuck out of his face, and I'm gonna win this fight." But uh, there's a there was a twister opportunity that yeah. I was really sad Brandon Brandon <laughs> missed. It was very very close, and I feel like if he just practiced that route, he would have jumped into it. Did you see it, Ralph? Of course I see it, dude. Okay, you know how many so, times so like, I have so after, foregone after a smart dropped, thing to try for the twister? Oh, motherfucker. I was so stoked. I was like, oh, shit. He's going to fucking twister him with a 
pepper in his shoulder? What a savage. <laughs> so, Kev, when they get to the post presser, Dana was very impressed by Moreno. They even announced it very quickly. They're like, you know what? We should just give it to him. But Dana in the post presser said, he's like, yeah, he's not fucking flying home to fucking Brazil. We're going to make this fight happen. 21 days. They're both healthy. Let's fucking do it. Yeah, perfect. That's the best idea you could do because we're not going to deal with all that COVID bullshit, right? We're not going to do the same thing. We're going to quarantine you. We're going to keep you here. We're going to meet, be smart on the money, and then we're going to fucking run it back. Also, great idea to keep a Mexican, keep him here away from his camp and keep a Mexican-American in a, in a good position to win that fucking title. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not that I'm saying there's, there's, there's favorites and shit like that, but possibly. I mean, let's put it this way. The UFC wouldn't hate the fact that one of their analysts for the Mexican Espanol telecast would happen to have a title on his hands. Nobody would really complain about that, I'm sure. Dude, that's what I've been saying. Is like, Could you imagine if Eddie allowed like Henry to do combat jiu-jitsu or... or one of these actual UFC fighters to do combat jiu-jitsu and, and not only be, you know, the combat jiu-jitsu world champ, but also be the, like, that would be huge for the CJJ world thing. You know what I mean? Like that would be huge to have Tony Ferguson, not only be the interim title champion, but also be the 155 or 170 pound combat jiu-jitsu champion. Yeah. Yeah. That would make it a lot more fun. And more importantly, I, I, I just keep thinking of what more can we do for these guys? And, Moreno's been one of those guys who stepped up at combat jiu-jitsu, so it's been nice to see him uh, get a shine time. So I'm pulling for him, man. That's that's a great thing. The hard part is, Davidson Figueroa yesterday showed us this division may be his for a while. You know, to me it didn't. I love Brandon. I love Brandon Moreno's jiu-jitsu. I love his striking. I love his boxing. I love the Mexican corazón that he has. He fights very, very Mexican, right? He's in your face. He's pushing the pressure. And that's the thing. He's like, if he steps into the pocket with Davidson Figueroa, that's a puncher's champ. But we have now seen what happens with a small grappling exchange. Mm-hmm. If there's somebody that has a little bit more mat sense, who knows what happens with, with Alex Perez on Fig- uh, Figueroa's back? I mean, possible. I just, I, I looked at how crafty he was yesterday and I said, all right, Figueroa. I was already sold, but now we're in. Like, I, I'm ready for a dynasty here. Was so. this a really good fight? Okay, okay, but, but, you guys are but hold on. Was it, kind of but hold on. Was he crafty or did he fall ass backwards into greatness? Like, he literally just, he did something that we're always taught in the wrestling never to do, was, was to reach back. I don't he know, reached, man. He, he got back. his back taken and he reached back. And, throw the and then he was like, oh, fuck, look at, look at this shit, a guillotine. And then fucking pow. It's just pretty impressive to go from falling ass backwards into a guillotine and not still acknowledge the fact that this motherfucker's first instinct <laughs> when he was about to be taken down was, I guess I should reap and see what happens here with this leg attack. To all yeah, of us for sure. in jiu-jitsu, I was like, wait, what are you doing in the fight for a championship? And for me, I said, yeah, you know what? I wish more of my fucking Hail Mary leg attacks while being taken down would end up in a guillotine. But, right, but listen, Raph, so like, look, if we look at like, I, I say, I say this from a purely objective point of view and like an outsider's perspective of my brother, right? My brother only understands wrestling. So when I have a jujitsu title fight here in town against these, when I've gone up to 170 or 175 to do no league championships versus these guys who do IBJJF and shit, um, my brother sits there for the whole card. And he watches Guy Black Belts go at it and these guys that I say are world class out of Arizona. Then he goes, what makes them world class? He goes, one guy will go for a takedown or the other guy will pull guard and they hold each other with their legs tied and none of them, none of them go for anything. He goes, the reason I like watching you grapple is because you grapple like you wrestle. You always yeah. go for the pin. You're always looking for something fucking flashy to entertain us. And you're always looking for those crazy ass leg locks and trips or you're looking for the back. He goes, that's what I come to watch. I don't watch these fucking dudes grab each other by their jacket, sit down and hold each other like fucking queers the whole time. So I told him, I go, okay, now look at that at the highest level of MMA, right? Those guys don't like to take chances because 
the, the risk is not worth the reward, but sometimes it is. And when you look at who makes the most exciting fighters, Justin Gaethje doing a forward, a forward rolling thunder. It's, you know, Conor McGregor doing some flashy ass shit before he finishes. It's Pejera uh, doing a backflip off the cage. It's uh, Michael Chaos, you know, the Chaos, what's his name? Fucking knocking people the fuck out. It's like all that crazy shit, the, the risks that, that end up panning out. Those are the biggest things that people pay tickets for. And that's what people buy the pay-per-views for. It's to see crazy-ass shit. Like, if you want to play it safe, cool. Fucking go to IBJJF. I don't know where we were supposed to go on this one, but I know it started with Davis and Figueroa, and it ended with fuck IBJJF. But we took a journey, and I'm glad I didn't that say did. go to. I didn't say fuck IBJJF. I said if you want to be boring, go to the IBJJF. If you want to be exciting, fight in the UFC or do fucking sub-only jiu-jitsu. Okay, well, we'll go back and make sure the tape says what it says. I will it ask this, though. Angry. It, gonna... <laughs> it did sound just a little bit angry about that. But, Tony, I would ask you this, though. So you're saying that you feel like the odds are good for Mourinho, at, at least within this fight. So do you see I really him... do like I, I really like the X and upset factor. It, it, it's, a high, it's a high potential. He... Excellent. Okay. Well, can I ask you too? Was this actually good, or just you guys are kind of hyping it up good? Because this was a lot of little guys and the pressers. Was it a good? Was it a good fight? No, it was not a good fight. It was the the potential of it being better than it was. Yes, I we I we really love the fact that uh, Alex showed promise in everything, and and he missed it by an inch, dude. Okay. How? And, but he ended up getting guillotined? Yeah, I mean, he ended up getting guillotined again by an inch. You know, Figueredo didn't do much. When we look at what Figueredo threw on the feet, you know, like it wasn't anything stunning to, to, to Perez. You know, Perez did all the work, got the takedown. Yeah, Figueredo threw some crazy bullshit scissor sweep. Didn't get – he got hammer-fisted twice. He let go of the leg lock, turned his back, got his back, almost takes him to fall into a guillotine. Yeah, and, and Kev, here's the thing you should know. Our analysis is like five times longer than the actual fight. So I don't want to make you feel like you missed the most incredible thing in the world, but it was fun to watch. And I do have a lot of respect for Alex Perez still going in there, storming in. It seemed like Alex Perez knew it might be a tall order and said, like, fuck it, dude. I'm either going to yeah, end this fast it, or be roll. in defense. Yeah. Exactly. And, that's, and I'll always fucking watch a fighter like that. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. And the fact is, is, like, he went out there and he put on for us. You know what I mean? He gave, like, he legitimately gave us hope. Like, oh, fuck, he looks good. Yep. Zero chance and... there was a sword involved, though, right? <laughs> there was a sword involved. <laughs> but he definitely, I mean, and, and Tony wants to point probably this out as well, which is, Kev, when he was getting that takedown, too, I was looking over and I was like, dude, he wasn't even sweating on that takedown. It came naturally. It looked beautiful. And that, that's that ray of hope that we saw with him. There was a very, very small detail. I'm sure everybody fucking missed. It was a very small little readjustment where he initially grabbed it and he reached, he tried reaching under the foot. Then he tried reaching under the foot. Then he reached under the foot, got it up. Like that little battle in itself was exhausting. Just to hold the leg with the right hand and try to scoop it up with the left to get it up on his shoulder. And then once he actually kicked the leg, I felt like he got to a point of, of uh, I'm a dog chasing a bumper, and I caught the bump, the, the car stops, and I caught it, and I go, well, what the fuck do I do now? Right. So that's when he kicked, the, he kicked the calf the first time. Should have kicked it a second time with, with real, you know, force. And, he, and, it, and it, was, it was too much. <laughs> it was too much time, and uh, Figueredo hit that little finish loop. Willie says he should have twisted his dick off. You know, that is always a sound strategy. So, noted, Dan or her desk there's my, squad. There's my, there's my Lee Brown belt giving you guys fight science. What's the Shevchenko <laughs> shit? She got a decision <laughs> win over Damian Maya's cousin? Right. Jill uh, Maya? One of, the only, the, Jill Maya, the only, uh, the only round she's ever lost, round two, right? In her career? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I didn't like the wrestle first strike last. Uh, game plan. Was it to tire her out? I don't know. But what it did was fuck her in round two. And now, the thing about it is, 
if you play that game with a, a legitimate black belt like uh, Maya, you, you could have got fucked up, you know? So when I looked at what was happening in the third, fourth, and fifth round, when Shevchenko really started opening up, the left hand was thundering. And exactly what DC Thunderous. said, she wasn't trying to land a crisp two. She was trying to fucking molly walk Maya. Mm-hmm. I'm in. All right. So now, this sounds like a good fight. It was interesting in this sense. In the first two rounds, Jennifer Maya, you know, it was weird. She had her chance to use some jiu-jitsu. And the first round, she got taken down, and she gets her in guard. The second round, she actually put some pressure on top. And my whole thing was, oh, shit, if she doesn't make something happen here with her jiu-jitsu, these next three rounds are going to be terrible. And they were for her as a result of that. Because you said, man, if your whole thing is... Okay, but what did did we see... What did we see jujitsu wise? Like we saw one shining thing from her jujitsu wise, okay? And it was when she avoided Shevchenko's uh, triangle from guard, right? <laughs> she had a very crisp moment when Shevchenko locked the triangle on the wrong side and she yeah. slipped her head out, okay? And then she ended up right back in full guard. Like as a jujitsu black belt, if I'm out of your triangle, I'm passing you on the far side. Right? And she never did that. She never ended up in side control. She never ended up in a, in a position where she could have advanced her game. She was always in a full guard or half guard. Well, keep in mind, right? and, when she had her in that actual full guard, Kev, she was blocking the absorption of any kind of punches. So in that first round, I was like, well, okay. If you were able to get some kind of sweep here, that'd be nice. But I get it. I don't want to be punched by Valentina either. In the second round, you see her have an opportunity to maybe try and do something there. And once I saw that, I was like, well, if you're supposed to beat her with jiu-jitsu, those were your shots. And it looks like nothing is going to come from that because Valentina is about to get mad and start piecing up your face. And guess what? Especially in round five when Valentina goes, is there a minute left? Yeah, I'll really go on her face now. Yeah, tight. Let me open the gas up. So I would say this uh, MMA junkie kept saying this this weekend and it really bugged me, Kev, but I need to get your analysis on this. They said that Valentina and her older sister were set to make sistery. Jesus Christ. Is that really a word now? They kept saying it. And I saw it once and on my Instagram, I said, no. Bad MMA junkie. Do not do that joke again. And sure as shit, those fuckers did it again. God damn it, John Morgan. (laughs) I like sistery. I don't understand what Tony's reaction is. My brothery instincts are that it's time to have a little herstory history mix. (laughs) I don't know. History herstory. Every time Uh, I saw them spell out sistery as a blah. So since the uh, I didn't see the Lipsky fight, um, yes. I did see the ending highlight where and her name's Antonia, right? Antonia? Yeah, Antonia, yeah. Antonia took her back and literally just proceeded to rain down. Yeah. Um, I thought the jujitsu of Lipsky would have played a little bit better. Like she, she could have. I I don't know, man. Like I thought that was coming out. Um, again, the, the dominant performance of both girls actually wrestling was fucking crazy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're training in Peru right now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know who the wrestling coaches down there are, unless they're at Tiger, uh, unless they're at Tiger Muay Thai, you know? Ooh. It's the brother, my, Willie says it's the brothers from Tiger Muay Thai. Thanks, Willie. The same Tiger Muay Thai <laughs> that was featured in Carol Baskin's home collection. We <laughs> Carol fucking Baskin. I would tell you this, by the way, Kev, direct hit on that one, because guess who Tony Wynn is Halloween for? So, just saying. Dude, you know what people keep saying is like, dog, you were twerking. You were twerking and being fucking Joe Exotic on fucking Saturday to fighting the UFC on Friday. <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> happened? And I went, listen, you always got to be ready, okay? You can't let Carol fucking Baskin ruin your career. <laughs> it is quite great to see that turn around because that's how crazy you can tell a fighter life is where you're like, fuck it, let's get ready for Halloween. Wait, am I fighting? Shit. Okay, well, let's get this yeah, shit like under that, control. The podcast today uh, before you guys was like, dude, you were literally twerking your ass on Friday and Saturday and then we saw you <laughs> in the UFC on Tuesday like, 
what was going through your mind? I go, fuck, I drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I also need to talk to our research department. Where's my fucking memo about what this guy's been up to? Uh, I know. Yeah. We don't prep them well enough, Kev. I will ask you this, Kev, because I did send you perhaps the greatest missed weigh-in of all time. It's one of the rare times when I almost wanted to ask you, Kev. Motherfucker. Are you willing to change your pick based off of this information? Because we've never really done that on Over Under, Kevin. Yes, but Kevin, I when I sent you that meme, did you want to change your pick? I wanted to change my pick immediately. I was like, I'm in the Mike Perry business. This is what I get. I get, baby, we're not even close. Dude, that, that shit's crazy. And the fact that the motherfucker dad was like, someone... Someone tweeted, can we, can we now, Dana, can we now cut the circus show? Like, when are you going to do that? You know what I mean? And then, the, then we were talking about uh, John Ennick saying, like, there should be more than just a 30% or 20% fine. Like, you should start one point down. You should, you know, uh, it, there's got to be some sort of substantial law. You know, motherfuckers yeah. don't give a shit about money. They're getting paid. You can pay Mike Perry five grand still. And he'll be like, oops, you know? <laughs> yeah. Tim there, means. You, you got you to gotta start like start the fighter one or two points down. <laughs> and one, you're going to, your knockout rate is going to go sky high because you're going to see motherfuckers fighting their ass off in round one and two. Right. Which is, can yeah. only lead to better fucking rating. But let's talk about Tim means hand speed. I don't even give a shit about the range. The hand speed was in fucking insane. Were you at all concerned for Tim Means, though? Because, dude, he was piecing him up, and I thought that was great. So the punch ratio was definitely in his favor, and the technique looked beautiful. But standing in front count, of Mike I would Perry. Never is, count Mike Perry out, dog. Is just Perry, like, yikes, still. Mike Perry threw an overhand right left hook that hit Means, and I go, Oh fuck. And I just like, I kind of pooped a little, like my, my butthole, like my sphincter <laughs> rattled. And I went, Oh fuck. And I just, I like grabbed Mercedes and we were sitting in the same chair and I went, Oh Jesus. And I, I just shook a little bit and I was very afraid for, for Tim Means. I went, Oh fuck. This is it. He's, he's going to get fucked up. I should and then also, it never happened. yeah, I mean, listen, Dirty Bird has been in some wars in the past as well, but this was one of those nice nights for him where he was winning the fight, but it still was happening to him. I do want to give us some context, oh though, Kev. God. Kev, what you should know in the true, I guess, shit show that is Mike Perry mm -hmm. was as he was walking out, he was supposed to have a different walkout song, but apparently Beyonce's Halo was playing, at which point he did start singing Halo. Baby, I can see a halo. Something yeah. about so, saving but, it. Is, am but, I right? So, just, who imagine up, more on. white guys I heard, screaming. I heard his girlfriend, but who else was cornering Mike Perry? Dude, I don't know. All I saw was the, the guy applying the Vaseline to his fucking face. I didn't even hear them talking. It was fucking weird. And I mean... Darren Till kept saying for legitimate reasons. He's like, dude, I know he hates me, but he, I legit would have quartered him. Yeah. So here's the other thing is like, look at Mike Perry's cardio. Like when you look at how terrible he could have been three rounds of that kind of output, like, yeah, Tim means put it on him. He hit him with some body shots. He could have, uh, Perry should have been, moving a lot slower weight than what he was. And his cardio stayed consistent for three fucking rounds. Like, he looked good, yeah. you know? And, I mean, bar the fact that he couldn't find his range, like, when he did charge in, he did go to land punches. He landed. They were powerful. Tim didn't fucking like it. And then he ended up having to get back to his range. As soon as, as, soon as Mean found his range again and started throwing body kicks, and, and it, it was just it was too much length, bro. And yeah. you saw Perry getting frustrated. You saw him not being able to get in. And, and it ultimately just led to the whole collapse of everything that he had. Yeah. <sighs> Kev, it's weird, man. And I would ask you this. 
what do you think the UFC should do with Mike Perry? Because do you know how similar you two fucks sound alike? I get really fucking weird trying to talk to both of you. Really? His his sultry business that crosses multiple tones and has a little uh Barry White, if Barry White was, you know, <laughs> born in LA and cultured, like what <laughs> Demolition Man envisioned as the ideal future. It's a movie starring one of the greats. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just your tone, but as soon as you guys start talking, you guys sound identical. Oh, yeah. Well, appreciate it. But what was the point? What well, was the question? I, I was just listening to you talk, and I couldn't fucking identify either of you. Well, love you too. But I uh, ultimately, this was the card that I thought was the worst. I thought this was a terrible card. I thought it was garbage. And I thought the coverage of it was laughable. Oh, hey, let's talk Paul Craig and fucking Rua. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. What did I tell you was going to happen? What did I tell tell you was going to happen? Well, first of all, freshman. I fucking told you. Hold on. Do, are you taking credit for the very well-established death of one Shogun who, uh, to the point where Dana White credit. said the, the magic words, which was, yeah, you should probably think about retiring. No, I told you specifically. It doesn't matter. He was undefeated for five years, right? He had a five-year win streak. Were he was five and one, something like that. Great. When were those five years? Five years from now, from five years from then, you, you know, it doesn't five matter. years before oh. Paul Walker left the franchise Fast and the <laughs> Furious. Okay. Well, anyways, listen, so Paul Craig looked amazing and whacked him up. Something fierce. Uh, the yeah, TKO, I mean, the TKO was tremendous. Yeah, dude, it was to, uh, to give you an idea, Kev, of what happened there. Uh, Paul Craig was thinking about trying to get maybe a rear naked choke and then instead decided, you know what, instead of having his back, I'm just going to flatten him out with the back mount and just start raining down some punches. Unfortunately, Shogun ended up tapping to those punches. Okay. So Shogun tapped? Yes. Holy shit. That's kind of nuts. I thought this whole point was Shogun's amazing. No, he was horrible. No, (laughs) it was not good. It was very sad to watch because, again, watching Shogun be in there right now, you can just think, like, you don't look like you need to be there, dude. He looked old. Yeah. Paul Craig looked fast. Shogun looked slow. Paul Craig dominated the wrestling, which was outstandingly surprising. I was like, holy fuck, Paul Craig just went for a double leg? What? (laughs) Yeah. Um, He got it. And Paul Craig was a delight in his post interview. Um, I also want to bring this up real quick. I, I didn't actually mention this with Mike Perry and Tim Means. Last little point I wanted to bring up about a Kev, which was they asked Tim Means, like, how did you feel about Mike Perry missing weight? And Tim Means was like, you know, I know he was trying to get under my skin and, you know, he was sending me things that was trying to disrupt me. People were sending me photos of him eating cheeseburgers two weeks out. He's like, Dude, I'm fine with it because guess what? I just got 30% of his fucking purse. So I just made 30 G's. God damn. That's fucking nuts. Yep. That's more it than I fun. even fucking signed for. Bro, listen. It's more than any of us for anything right now. I would tell Ugh. you this, though. Think about this fight. And I want you to walk me through your recollection of it. Because Joaquin Buckley just pieced up Jordan Wright. And that was a little sad because we know Jordan. And I was yeah, like, dude, it's did, a tall order, man. Not, no, no, no. Did, did we not say that the boxing was going to be the, the edge in the whole in the whole thing? Did we not say that at the, at the pre-show? We did. And one of the things that we were also noting was Buckley is clearly the favorite here. Like, Buckley has that going on. That being said, the UFC could not stop promoting him. So they have big wishes for the dude who is referred to no less than 19 times on the show as viral sensation Joaquin Buckley. Yeah, I mean, what's crazy is less than promoting Joaquin Buckley as more than promoting Taekwondo. Because 
the two touch kick was talked about way more than actually Buckley was. If you listen to it, it was like talking about the actual art of the kick and how that kick originated and where it's from. Like it was, it was more about the kick. Yes, he comes, and yes, they did start talking about how crafty he is and how crazy he is that he hit that in a live fight and how crazy it is to even try to execute that or why he executed or why he even tried it. But when you think about everything, we, we talked about how the boxing was going to be the difference and maybe his, his craftiness and his creativity. But, dude, I, I mean, the shit was insane. He just put a fucking straight-up beating on that, dude. Yep. I also want to get your thoughts. Nicholas Dalby versus D-Rod. What did you think of that fight overall? Perhaps, perhaps D Rod won. Like we could look at, we could look at D Rod eating nine hundred head kicks, but yeah. also being very in front of Dalby and putting hands on him. I, that, that one's a hard one. That was also when I was starting to leave the house and take my kid. But I watched that fight and I was like, oh fuck, Dalby came out strong. He came out very, very technical with his uh taekwondo karate style land a lot of head kicks and then all of a sudden uh daniel started throwing a bunch of throwing a bunch of hands to the head so i think round at the end of round two is when i started leaving Mm -hmm. maybe i was watching round three kind of but i i mean it that one was hard like what scores more punches or kicks yeah and it's not muay thai and the hard part is looking at the crispness of D rods and I will hundred percent say, I mean, he's a friend of our show, so there's always going to be some kind of bias with that. But I just thought, man, when he connected, those hits did not look very uh, easy to take. Like every one of those punches. No, sure, looked but like even, they had but even being power friendly, and, but even being friendly and objective, those punches hurt. Right. Yeah. And like, this isn't Muay Thai where you go, okay, elbows are highest scoring. Knees are second highest scoring. Kicks, punches, sweeps. Right? You don't do that. You go significant strikes, strikes landed. Right? So maybe significant strikes on kicks landed more, which I didn't see the metrics. But a lot of fucking hands hit Dolby. Yeah. So, yeah, that one, I would have to watch that one again and go, oh, shit, I see. I see why Dolby won. You know? Yeah. So... Let's very much uh, kind of go over these last couple that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, (laughs) Kev, uh, the Disney prince ended up getting a win. He looked a little less like a Disney prince, though. Yeah, Joe Bond got the win over Jared Gooden. Uh, Tony, did you catch that fight as well? I did, yes. So I thought the initial kicks from Joe Bond were a fight tone setter so sure. Some of the things that Gooden was doing with his jab and hook was essentially what led to Joe Bam's eye getting shut. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end, I I feel like Joe Bam looked worse because of the speed of the kicks. And then Joe highlighting how bad the speed of the kicks were coming out. (laughs) It's it's never good. You you always got to watch a fight. Like when you want to watch a fight objectively, watch it on mute, right? Because you'll see, you'll see very clearly the fight. And then you'll, when you watch it with commentary, you'll see very clearly the bias. And uh, no matter what the bias is, even him just highlighting the fact that the kicks were coming out slower, people and judges go, oh, yeah, he looks like shit. It's slow. Yeah, he slowed down a lot. This is horrible. He's not, he's not winning this. You know, so it's like it's a weird thing to listen to what the commentary is saying. But you definitely saw, you know, him landing those very hard, crispy body kicks, that left hand, and then all of a sudden in the fucking second and third round, he started throwing like this little weak, limp kind of kick. And it was like, damn, like I want to see him get his hands in front of those so that those little weak kicks kind of look a a little bit just like a weak follow-up versus you're just throwing a naked kick and and it's weak. Yeah, and I I think that's what it was. It was a naked kick, right? He threw a couple of naked kicks that got him countered as well. Yeah, 
I, am, am I remembering this right? Yeah. No, you, sure. you are. It was like it was weird because I felt like that first round, Jovan had a little bit of time where he needed to adjust. And then he started looking better in that second round. And by the end of it, I was like, dude, all right, good for him. He's really coming together but and it, he's pulled together good. Yeah, so that's, that's like a typical Muay Thai fighter, right? It's like he's from mm-hmm. Saxon. So, like, that's yeah. a very typical Muay Thai fighter. Round one sucks. Look at Donald, right? Round one sucks. Round two and three are fighting. And that's just like that slow tie start because we go back in history to, to, you know, tie betting, but that's how pads go. When you hold pads, your teacher starts out slow, you know, one jab, one kick, you know, one cross, one kick, you know, jab knee. And then all of a sudden in round two and three, it's one, two, three kick, you know, two, three, two, double kick, you know, and it's like, holy shit. Like, why did we go from fucking, you know, pot shots and a <laughs> kick here and there to fucking 30, you know, 30 combos, 20 kicks. What the fuck just happened? <laughs> Raph, I'm completely lost. I understand. Energy, but I'm not following. Well, so, Kev, listen, here's... Some... All right, listen. So, Kev, in, in Thai history, right, the reason round one and two sucks for Thai fighters, I didn't end, they give those rounds to the betters. The betters go, oh, I like him. He looks good. They let the bets and the money come in. And then round three, four, and five is when the fight typically actually starts. Okay. Right? So so rounds one and two are kind of a show to see who looks good, who's looking crisp. And then the last three rounds is, is when the fight kind of happens. So the money comes in on round one and two, and then the fight happens three, four, and five. That's how Muay Thai goes. And that's just like traditional Thailand. So when you get a traditional Thai coach like uh, Saxon Janjira, his pads are going to be similar, I would assume, right? It's going to be slow pads, and that's how my, my Thai coach was, Nunxiam. The slow pads, round one and two, and then round three, four, and five, high output, and you're choking on your fucking spit, and you want to die. And then <laughs> I, uh, I can't say that. Never mind. I can't fucking tell you what he said I kick like. So anyways. <laughs> Well, that's good to know. Kev, I'm going to let you know one big thing. What? Which is that the opening bout of the night with Sasha Palatnikov and Louis Kosk was fire. Like, that was a brilliant way to start the night, dude. If you really want to go take away one, go watch that. Uh, I told you, the motherfucker that came from the land of the cold, the land of the ice and snow, he's going to fuck somebody up. I wasn't wrong. I didn't know that Tony had savored all of this. Now I understand why he was going so quickly to find a charger. He's like, I have to tell these people what I saw very quickly because I want to make sure that we knew those things. I checked in at 4 p.m. Were my fucking bike right? What the fuck happened? You know what it was? So, Tony. I'm pretty sure I did fucking good. No, Uh, no, Tony. I don't mind that, but here's what happens. So we do like a fight companion whenever we're watching these things. And when you talk about not listening to the commentary, that is part of the reason why I like doing the fight companion, because it's just me reacting or our guests that we bring on on that to just purely what we're seeing, because I do feel like people get sucked into that world. And the hard part is is that I'm so sucked into that world when I get a text from you on air, I'm laughing because I was like, Yo, I don't even know how your picks are doing right now. I don't know them off the top of my head because we get so many people who send them in. I was like, but it's probably going to be interesting between you and Kevin. Kevin, would you like to take over from here? Not a ton. Okay. It's 8-8. Eight, eight. Dude, what's crazy? Okay, what's crazy to me? I'm sorry, did you say yes? Because I wanted to talk. I didn't hear you. Go ahead. Do you have something already... to say, East Coaster, before no. I reveal the scores? Were you? I can... All I wanted to say was keep it punctual. I don't like, I don't like how DC and John Anik casually missed some very violent elbows from Tim Me. Like and, they were like, and uh, a very nice up elbow from Tim Me just seconds ago. And it's like, are you kidding me? That guy <laughs> fucking just up elbow like Terry the fucking hell. And you just said a nice one seconds ago. Suck my dick. That was fucking epic, and you missed it because you're talking about, you know, Paul Felder's retirement. What the fuck you're talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. 
I, I, let me just say from the broadcaster standpoint, because I do speak Anik, I do understand that. And he's from the broadcaster standpoint, behind all the time. Well, yeah, dude, because here's what happens when you check in with your talent, your guys who are supposed to be filling, you're supposed to set them up. And he doesn't do that as well. But if he feels that there's a little bit of a lull where either DC's eating something and not paying attention or Joe's fucking so high he forgets where he is, that does happen on occasion. Then you hear Anik do something like, and you see two of those elbows right there looking pretty good. That's his way of filling for someone else to come and jump in. And that's when you Dude, hear DC. That's the crazy part is because I'm like, holy fucking shit. He means he's running an elbow to fucking his nose. And whoa. Anyways, continue. I don't <laughs> like, What do you mean? Like, el- again, like elbows score really high. Like that could have led to a potential cut that could have potentially ended the fight. So when mm-hmm. I go... And anyways, five seconds ago, Tim Means landed a jab elbow to his face, which <laughs> was nice. I will and then tell DC's, you. DC's like, yeah, it's crazy when you're wrestling with be. I mean, you know, you never <laughs> understand the kind of pressure that someone can put on you. Like, Here's what, what you got to know. Did you the, just say to me? The, the joke that we consistently say about DC is DC sounds on the play. Like your dad's friend, he invites over, but that you don't really like, but he likes to talk about the years that he was in football or wrestling 40 years ago. And you go, dude, well, this guy shut up. Like, God damn it. Because DC, if you ever want to know how to start, like what he is about to commentate and sound like it always to me, start like uh, starts like he's going to start off by saying, oh boy, I just love when some guys get in there and they get that single leg and that. And we're like, DC, they are punching right now. Where the fuck did you come up with the single leg? Not everything's Bro, wrestling. You have all, yeah, you have fucking Alzheimer's. What's going on? Yeah, anyway, they're beloved. I get that. Kevin, where would you like to go, sir? Oh, I guess I'll try and fucking announce something now, <laughs> but I'll just okay. fuck off if you guys decide to take it another direction for 18 minutes. I had Dacus, you had Stavkus. I'm talking through you, Ohio. We both had D-Rod. We both had Paul Craig. I had Michael Perry. You had Tim Means. And baby, that one wasn't close. We both had Huban. We both had Shevchenko. We both had Bucky. I had Shevchenko. You had Lipsky. I won the Shevchenko parlay. Suck it, world. We both had Moreno. We, We didn't both have Chuck again. Only I did. But only you had Polodkinov. And then only you had Figueiredo. Because I came within an inch. Your words of winning with Perez. Which, if you're keeping track at home, takes us to an 8-8 tie. Things have really heated up. It's neck and neck. We're throwing slanders. We don't like each other. One of us is thinking about our abs. The other is like, I'm gifted sexually. We move two (laughs) extra innings. You have Buckley, you piece of shit, you win. I don't remember what the thing is. It says something about eating a Carolina Reaper. Ah, no. damn it. I thought I had to eat a, I thought we were eating cookie-shaped dicks or dick-shaped cookies. Dick-shaped cookies? That's right. We were going to make a dick-shaped yeah. cookie. That's That was the big thing. Didn't you so. say you were making dick-shaped cookies? But, yeah, you have to eat a Carolina Reaper. That sounds about right. So I'm going to make you a dick-shaped <laughs> cookie, don't worry, and I'm going to nickname it the Carolina Reaper, and people are going to know why. So can't wait. <laughs> Saucy. Let me tell you, I, I, there's nothing funnier to me than in the background of Kevin going over the announcements and getting to the end of it, you just hear Virchag on the side just be like, Saucy. Saucy. <laughs> like he's throwing in ad-libs in a fucking Drake song. Dude, I get it. I appreciate you. Tony, here's what one of the reasons why I had to bring you on as our over under guest. I need somebody who talks shit, who's passionate about fights, who loves to talk about the actual science behind the fights. You check off all three of those boxes. But there's a fourth box that I saw that you were putting up today. And I don't know if it was actually just today, but you were saying something to the effect of something with seminars and trying to help people out right now, given all things COVID and how people seem to be very, very different or going through hardships. So what exactly are you doing and and what are you looking to do to help people right now, sir? Oh, dude, I love you. You're a saint. So, um, yeah, 
right now in 2020 leading up to Thanksgiving this week and then Christmas in two or three weeks. Um, there's been people who's lost their jobs, whose finances have slowed down. Um, the only thing I know how to do is, is kick ass and teach people jujitsu and fighting. So, uh, the way that I can think to give back is to offer every single gym in Tucson, a free seminar. And by free, it's no cost to me. I'm just doing this to teach knowledge of whatever they want, or whether it's an MMA, MMA seminar, leg locks, rubber guard, wrestling, whatever they want, I can, I'll teach it. But they have to bring at least a $10 minimum donation, um, four cans of food of, you know, non-perishables, and then, uh, you know, a toy. And that way we hit three different charities. We can hit Toys for Tots, we can hit the Community Food Bank, and then we can literally just give a parent or, you know, a family some cash money to pay maybe a, a gas bill or a water bill or electric bill something that they're faltering on this holiday season. Um, that's something that I've been, you know, thinking about as a father's in 2020, I could just cannot think about kids not thinking that Santa isn't coming and that the holidays aren't coming. They have to stay away from their family because of COVID. Like I, I just, I don't like that shit. And more than ever, when, when everyone's saying we're alone together and we're this and that, there's people who are literally alone. There's single mothers who don't have anybody. There's, you know, dads raising kids that don't have anybody. There's people who are literally just alone, alone. And then we're not alone together. They're alone, alone. And I would really like the jujitsu communities to reach out to me, DM me. Um, if you guys want to do a free seminar, I'll come out. Um, I'll teach a two hour seminar, whatever it is that you want. Combat jujitsu, wrestling, like I said, Muay Thai, hold pads, whatever it is but we definitely need to help a lot of people in our community. There was a time when I thought I was going to be in need. I wasn't, um, whether I was roofing this whole time, uh, whether it was the tremendous members at 10th planet Tucson that consider that, that just continue to pay their memberships and, and help everybody in their community. Um, whether it was the seminars that I did in Texas, I have a window of opportunity to help people financially, uh, through technique some way. And I want, to do that. I want gym owners to reach out to me and I want people to worry less about a virus and worry more about people and love and the spirit of Thanksgiving and Christmas because as adults we have to take on the the ugly truths of the world and we have to shelter our beautiful children away from the ugly shit that happens in the real world and I think that we need to really show that the spirit of Thanksgiving and Christmas is still alive and uh, I'm willing to do that just by, by teaching at your academy and your students donating some part of themselves, um, you know, through, through cash, through a toy, through four cans of, uh, of food. And I think that's an easy way to show love and support to our community. Wow. Well, now I'm only kind of glad I lost you then. <laughs> Dope. <laughs> Hell yeah. You did it. Tony. Obviously, we appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, I know you just did a major plug. Kevin, do you have any departing words for Tony before we start to make the transition out? I love you. I enjoy you. I don't want to see you again on this platform. I can't believe you won <laughs> fucking Buckley. Man. Fuck him. <laughs> Doesn't he have enough <laughs> shit going for him? He's good at fighting. Like he's physically dominant. Congrats to you and your bullshit. Sick. I got dope hair, too. Ah. <laughs> Raph, I'm done. All right, Tony, where can people find you? Go ahead and give a plug. Guys, please follow me at a Burchak MMA. That is a B I R C H A K M M A. That is on Twitter, Instagram, on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash Anthony Burchak. Again, that's B I R C H A K B as in boy. I R C H A K M M A. That's what's up. Tony, we appreciate you, man. You're doing good things, obviously, by opening up your schedule. I think that's important when it is a hard time for so many people, and uh, it's commendable. I hope people take you up on it. If they don't, maybe then you should threaten them with the spirit of Christmas and just kind of raise a hand and see what happens. But let's hope it doesn't have to get to that either way. Honestly, man, honestly, man, I, I really hope people do. 
Um, I would really hate for people to fear a virus more than uh, a parent not being able to provide for their children. I, I think that's a, a different thing to fear. And um, I would really hope people in the community understand, you know, one might bring you down, but the other one will for sure bring you down. Yeah. Well, Tony, we always appreciate you, man. I know you were always busy. We appreciate you again, making the time to come back on. Two weeks in a row. It's been a long time coming for you to make it on Verbal Tap, man. Thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. Love you guys. I'll see you next time. The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... Please note, the new number is...